Hi, well, welcome. My name is Gerard Long, and welcome to everyone who's at Highland Park and Crossroads and O1. It's a great privilege and honor for me to be here this morning. Jean and I uh, see Christchurch as our home church, having attended here for many, many years. And as I look around, I see uh, dear, dear friends who have loved us so, so very much uh, over all these years, and hopefully will continue to love us. Um, and it's also very special to be here because it's an opportunity to say thank you to so many of you. Uh, 2005, I was here speaking the eulogy for my youngest son, Alex, who went home early at 17 years old. And then just two years ago, I was standing in this very spot saying the eulogy for our beautiful daughter, Rebecca, who went home early as well. And your love to us was though God was hugging us through you. You really did show the love of God in a very beautiful way. We are, we're told in scripture, the body of Jesus Christ, his hands and feet here on earth. And you showed this in an amazing way. I've told so many people that. Your, your prayers, obviously, but also practical gifts, the food that we received for many weeks when we were so broken, we could hardly move. And you helped us out in those times, messages um, and uh, scriptures and flowers and all sorts of love coming to us. It makes a big difference when the body works like that. So thank you. And I'm so pleased to be able to say that to you. You know, one, very often people say to us, how do you live each day after the death of two of your three children? And I can say unequivocally this morning that it's only by God's grace. I can only stand here because of God's grace. I know that so, so well. And God's grace comes to us in so many different ways. And one of them, of course, is through Scripture. He speaks to us. He encourages our souls. He gives us strength. He restores our soul through his living word. And the passage this morning that Alison referred to, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, are three verses that have mean so much to me. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. That first uh, scripture there, um, one of the things I love about the Bible is it's honest. And we see that it's telling us that we're wasting away. Now, any of us who are over 40 here, and I'm many years over 40, trust me, um, you know that we're wasting away. You know it, get, it gets harder every morning. You get out of bed and you have to stretch a bit more to just keep moving. We're wasting away. But notice in that scripture, it's saying that something else is going on. Because we're told through scripture that as we walk with Jesus, we're being renewed by the Holy Spirit inside. Our spirits are being renewed and refreshed. And then in the second uh, verse to look at, in verse 17, it says that our light and momentary troubles, again, the honesty of it, I don't expect there's anyone here this morning who hasn't gone through trouble or isn't going through some form of trouble right now. Jesus promised us, in this world, it's a broken world, in this world, we will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. So we go through trouble, but again, there's something more to look at here because scripture is saying, but as we're faithful to following Jesus, it says we are winning for ourselves an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, our faithfulness to God's calling is giving us a weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Mother Teresa said, I don't pray for success, I ask for faithfulness. So all God is asking us to do, be faithful to what he's given each one of us to do. And so as we, as we are faithful, there's an eternal weight of glory that's there, eternal. And my talk this morning is on the eternal perspective. The last scripture we're going to look at there is verse 18. It says, we fix our eyes, therefore, not on the things that are seen, but on the un things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the unseen things are eternal. Now, you might be asking, well, how do you fix your eyes on things that are unseen? 
A bit of a paradox, isn't it? Well, in this instance, Scripture is talking about a different set of eyes. I don't know if you knew that you've got two sets of eyes. We have our natural eyes where we say, I can see you here. You're looking fantastic this morning. You're naturalized, but the Bible speaks about us having another set of eyes. It's called our, the eyes of our heart in Ephesians 1, or the eyes of our spirit. It's the spiritual eyes. And we're taught to walk as Christ followers by faith. You know that? We walk not by sight, but by faith. And faith is seeing things that are unseen. Remember, the definition of faith is being sure of what you hope for, certain of what you cannot see. It's not blind faith, by the way. It's based on unequivocal evidence of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the grave we know it's true in scripture so we're told to walk by that and as we do that we start to see the things that are eternal and you and I know that the lens that you look through life on has a huge impact on how you live Jean and I were in a cinema not so long ago and we were thinking either we're getting aging very quickly or something wrong with my eyes because everything looked very blurred as I looked up at the screen. And then I remembered they gave us these glasses as we came in, we put these glasses on and suddenly there was all this three dimension there. Everything was jumping off the screen of this. Amazing. The lens through which you see things has a huge impact on how you live. In 1941, Admiral Nimitz had just been appointed by President Roosevelt to take over in Pearl Harbor. And on Christmas morning, he decided to go on a boat trip around the harbour. And as they came into the mooring, uh, the boatman said, well, Admiral, what, what do you see? And he said, well, he said, I, I see all the devastation. I see the eight battleships and that many other ships that have been sunk. I see the despair over the base. But he says, I see another thing as well. He says, I see God's mercy on America. Because he said... Those 200 attack aircraft from the Japanese fleet did three basic mistakes in any, any attack. Number one, they attacked on Sunday morning when nine out of 10 of the crew were on shore. If they'd waited until the fleet was at sea, they would have not just been 3,800 seamen killed, there would have been 38,000 killed. Number two, yes, they destroyed all these ships, but they didn't destroy our dry docks. We can now take these ships and we can repair them relatively quickly. And hey, there's a crew that's there waiting to come and fill these ships. Number three, just five miles away from the harbor was all of our fuel. It would have taken one plane to strife that fuel and we really would have been in deep trouble. He was looking through a different set of eyes, a different lens. He, was, he saw that yes, the Japanese may have won that battle, but they weren't gonna win the war. And the time frame that we put on the things that we see in our lives has a big impact. You, you know, I know that. Our everyday decisions, isn't it? You can have an extra drink after work, thinking, oh, that's fine. And then you end up with a DUI against you. If you don't control your heart and your mind and your, your eyes, you can end up having an affair and destroy your marriage and your family. Or in financial investments, I was in banking for 30 years, I, I understand that when you make an investment, you're considering all the factors, particularly the time frame. And if you don't see that longer time frame, you can make bad decisions. Well, Scripture teaches us to see the longer time frame. Scripture teaches us that this life is a vapor. It's a breath relative to eternity. Moses says in Psalm 90 in verse 12, he says this, Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You see, as, we, as we're living out God's will here on earth, uh, we do it in the context of eternity. And when we see eternity, we live very differently. It says in Scripture in, in uh, Philippians uh, 2 uh, that, uh, that God is working in us to will and to act for his good pleasure. He's working in our lives for his good pleasure. And what we do here on earth impacts earth, but also impacts the heaven. In other words, how we live now will be taken through into eternity. It says in, in Revelation, Jesus says, I'm coming back. That's a great thing as Christ followers. Jesus is coming back. I don't think it's very long. He's coming back. And he says, I'm coming back with my reward for, those, for all that we've done while here on earth. You see, we are rewarded for our faithfulness to God's calling. And those rewards go with us through eternity. Let's just make it clear. We don't get to heaven by our works. We know that. It's by grace 
through faith in Jesus Christ. But we are called unto good works. Each one of us, God from the creation of the universe knew us by name and knew the works that he wanted us to do. The things that bring his glory here on earth. And as we're faithful to those things, guess what? His kingdom comes down on here on earth and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So every one of us has been called to different work. Let me just give an illustration, if I may. For this, I need a volunteer. Do we have a volunteer? Thank you very much. That's good. Well, very good. Very good. And this is just to get the point across that, you know, our life, <clears throat> I know it can seem very intense, but the Bible teaches us to see beyond the natural. Thank you so much. Bless you. So I, I'm going to make this illustration. Before I do that, I just, C.S. Lewis, many of you have heard of C.S. Lewis wrote the Narnia novels. He said this, our life here is the cover page of a never-ending story. This life is a vapor, okay? And that's represented, you can't hardly see it because it's just a thread. Can you just about see that? That's our life here, okay? That's our life here. Now, if we, if we may, can I just unravel that ribbon? Thank you, Mike. It's limited because eternity goes on forever and this ribbon doesn't go on forever and ever. But you get the idea, do you? You can get it. That's our life here and then there's eternity. And the Bible says, lift up your eyes, live for those things that are above. Be wise how you live. Thank you. Would you mind rolling it up? I didn't tell you that, but thank you so much. <laughs> our faithfulness to his calling is reward. Over a hundred times through the New Testament it talks about rewards, eternal rewards. Eternal it means it go on forever. And you see, when you see this, it makes no sense just to live for your life down here. Jesus said, build up for yourselves treasure in heaven. There's things that we'll be doing through eternity. Yes, we will be working, by the way, through eternity. It's all good, all for God's glory. That self is gone, praise God. <laughs> Excuse me. So God wants us to see that longer term. I came to a deep revelation of eternity through a broken heart. In 2004, I said to my wife, Jeannie, I said, Jeannie, does it get any better than this? And maybe some of you here are on the top of the mountain, and if you are, great, enjoy it. You may not always be there, but enjoy it where you are now, now, as it is. I said to Jeannie, this is amazing. I had a deep walk with God. I loved my wife with all my heart. She was very precious to me. I had three beautiful children, all very talented and doing great things, great athletes, bright and everything else attending a great church here at Christ Church. We were seeing many people come to faith in Jesus on, through Alpha that we were running in our home and then in the church. Some of you may have come to Christ on some of those Alpha courses, possibly. Working for, as an expat international banker, living here in Lake Forest, beautiful Lake Forest. Does it get any better than this? But it was only a few months after that that our world completely fell apart. Our youngest son, Alex, was 17 years old and he took a drug with a boy at school and became delusional, got very confused. And on the 8th of November, Jeannie was cooking his favorite meal. Little did she know then that he was never gonna come back for that meal or any other meal because he went down to the lake and he took his life. And unbelievable darkness and horror came upon our family. Jeannie's mother's heart was completely shattered. She went from shock to horror, to anger, to hatred, and finally to unbelief. She couldn't reconcile how this God that we've been following for 24 years with all of our hearts could have allowed such evil to happen. And she went into unbelief. She, she lost her faith for a season. But as much as Jeannie ran away from God, I, I ran into God. And I used, used to go in the early hours of the morning. I used to get up one or two o'clock and go down to my study. And, and, I, and I wept. This is deep, deep, guttural weeping. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. My body shook. And I cried until I had no more tears to cry. And then I'd crawl back to bed and try and get one or two more hours before I had to go off to work. And my prayer was very simple at that time. It was simply, God, why? You're my best friend. Why? 
You're all powerful, all knowing. You hold everything together. We just sang about he's in control. He is in control. He holds everything together by the power of his word. Why, God? Why? Why have you allowed this to happen? And God came to me in that time. The intimacy of our fellowship at that time was unbelievable. The presence of God would come in that room. And I remember one time very clearly, I felt an arm around me. And I looked up, there was no one there physically, but I realized Jesus was there with me. And you know what he was doing? He was sobbing with me. He was sobbing with me. And I saw then how God's heart is broken with all that he sees on earth, all of suffering and all the pain and all that's going on. It breaks God's heart. It really does. And you might be saying, well, hang on, if, if he's a sovereign God, all-powerful, why, why does he allow all this suffering on the earth? And that's a good question. God likes us to, to, to bring questions to him. And here's what, I, here's what I saw so clearly, that you know, God is looking for a people. He's working for a people that will come to him and want to be with him for eternity. And this is the age of decision. Maybe there's people here this morning who've not made a decision for Jesus Christ. I pray that this morning you will make a decision that you want to have Jesus in the center of your life and have your sins forgiven, that you can be with God for eternity. God's looking in this time, this age. The Bible talks about two ages. There's this age, and then there's the age that goes on forever. When we pass from here, we go on forever with God or apart from God. And so God's looking for this, our people that will come and say, I want to be with you, Jesus, or, or the rest for, for eternity. I want to live for you. I want to go your way, God, with everything you can. And you know, to have that choice, because God wants us to choose to go his way, we have to have free will. And when you have free will, you have to have the ability to say no. Otherwise, it's not free will. And so we see right at the beginning of humankind in the Garden of Eden, God had said, if you go, if you go this way, you'll have fullness of life with me, but you go your own way, there's going to be death and suffering and pain. And humankind at that point made that decision to go away from God. And from that point, death and destruction came into this world. Suffering and brokenness has happened for 6,000 years since then. There's been darkness on earth to this very day. And you don't have to look very far around. We live in a broken world. But the great news is that God, in his mercy, didn't leave us like that. He came through Jesus Christ to rescue us. And Jesus came to this earth to walk for a while amongst us, show us what God's love looks like, die a most horrific death, tortured to death in front of his mother. Most horrendous thing. You could say it was the worst thing that's ever happened on planet Earth. But it's also the most loving thing that's ever happened on planet Earth. Because through his death and resurrection, he brought to the Father a people that are his very own. He brought to the Father people who want to be with him for eternity. And Jesus said on the cross, it says, for the joy set before him. What was he doing? He was seeing eternity. For the joy set before him, he endured the pain. Joni Erickson Tata, she uh, had a diving accident at uh, 16 or 17 years old, and she became a paraplegic. And for the 40, 50 years, she's been living in a wheelchair. And she's, she's very faithful to Jesus. She says this, she said, sometimes God permits what he hates, to accomplish what he loves. He did that for his son. He crushed his son that you and me could be with him for eternity. Isn't that unbelievable? That's unbelievable love. So as I started to see that, I said, okay, Lord, I realize that through this, you want to do something greater for eternity. That the pain that we're suffering now is going to be outweighed by the glory that's going to come this for your name. And we see that through, through the Bible, don't we? We see it in Joseph. We see it with Moses, we see it with David, obviously we see it in the cross, right through, right into the New Testament, those disciples who laid their lives down that people can't be one for Christ. So I said, okay, Lord, I, I don't like this cup, it's a bitter cup, but by your grace, I want to go forward and I want to be faithful. And some of you may be thinking this morning, my life's pretty bitter. And God's just saying, come close to me. Hebrews 4, 16, it says that we go boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what I used to do in the early hours, still do it. Reach out to God for help to go through, to be faithful. So I said, okay, God, what do you want to do with my brokenness? Well, first thing for all of us, he wants us to keep loving. So I had to love Jeannie even when she was so broken. Keep loving. 
And then, okay, Lord, what else? What, what, what do you want? And I felt God calling me out of 30 years in banking. I took early retirement and I uh, joined Alpha. Do you know what Alpha's about? It's about rescuing souls for eternity. I had such a burden in my heart because I realized, what's this all about? It's about rescuing people for eternity. Jesus has passed the baton onto us to say, would you be my hands and feet to rescue people for eternity? And so I said, okay, Lord, we'll do that. And I had the, the privilege of leading Alpha USA for eight years. And we saw hundreds of thousands of people come to faith in Jesus over that time. Wonderful. And our precious daughter, Rebecca, she came and she had just done an MBA at Loyola University, 25 years old, brilliant athlete, just remarkable. Some of you knew her, just a very beautiful, precious, precious girl. She, she was living with us. She lived with us for 10 years. We had a great privilege of, of, of her living with us. And she uh, was our best friend. And she used to drive with me to work. I used to drive through Lake Forest here and that, go down Waukegan Road. We lit, had our office in Bannockburn. We'd cross the railway track halfway down Waukegan Road. Sometimes we'd get a Starbucks on the way. And when we crossed those railway lines, we just started to pray. We used to pray every morning for different things, for her friends, my friends, for the work and everything else. It was a sweet time. It was a happy time. It was a precious time. And then in 2014, uh, she was a national director for youth. She had such a heart for young people because of what happened to her, her younger brother, Alex. She um, was leading that uh, across the country and she was down with me in San Diego. And we were sharing a platform. We were speaking together at a big Latino conference. And I had to leave to go to London and she had some more appointments and everyone wanted her to speak and you know, they wanted to meet her and everything. She said, what wonderful young lady. And I was over in London with Jeannie. Rebecca flew back here to Chicago and on, on the 8th of May, she went out for a run. And some of you may remember the 8th of May, 2014, because the town was full of, I understand now, police cars and helicopters. She went down to the lake it was an unusually hot day and she went down to try and cool off and we knew she had blood sugar issues and we think she probably fainted, fell into the lake, couldn't get out where she'd fallen in, tried to swim round to where the ramp was. The water was 37 degrees and she got hypothermia and she drowned. Jeannie had been coming back to faith in Jesus but before then, and Rebecca had been instrumental in helping her to come through, been loving on her and encouraging her. And now suddenly, bang, she's gone too. And Jeannie, her fragile tra her heart was completely shattered again. And she realized she couldn't do more, eight more years. And she made a decision to take her life. And she went up to Rebecca's bedroom. And she wasn't going to come out of Rebecca's bedroom. And God came into that room at the time she was going in, in there as well. And she didn't see a physical being, but she saw light, just this incredible white light was there in this room. And God opened the eyes of her heart to his glory. And she saw, had a glimpse of the glory of God, had a glimpse of how great God is and how tiny we are. See, our, our, our vision of God needs to be much, much bigger <laughs> He does hold everything together by the power of his word. He is all powerful, all control. And she saw that. And as she saw that, she realized that she's so tiny compared to how big he was. And that offense that she had in her heart, one child God and now two children come on, that dissipated in the presence of God. And the Lord spoke to her and said, Jeannie, your, your grief is not your own. And she, she, her heart from that moment on was to say, okay, God, I just want to do your will. You see, when you see God, when you see his glory, really the response is like Saul when he was knocked off his horse. Okay, what do you want me to do? And she came there. She said, all I want to do now is to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful daughter. You've done what I've asked you to do. She came downstairs. I was sitting downstairs reading John 6, which is another whole other story, linked to what she'd just been through. And I said to her, Jeannie, what has happened to you? Her, her face had changed. You remember Moses up the mountain and his face is shy. She literally had the presence of God on her in an amazing way. And I said, what's happened? And she told me what had gone on. Now, at that stage, because we were so raw and so hurting, we weren't seeing 
many people at all, hardly, hardly any, just one or two dear friends. It just so happened, a God incident, that that day we had two meetings with dear friends. First of all, Judy Cole was coming around for coffee. She came in, it was in the morning, and the first thing she said to Jeannie is, Jeannie, what's happened to you? The presence of God was on her. And then we were meeting our dear friends, Daniel and Alyssa, later that night. And they opened the door, and Alyssa, sometimes, sometimes the women are more astute than the guys. <laughs> they see, she, she said, what has happened to you? So now we have three witnesses of the, pre, of, the, of the impact of the presence of God. And she now was with me saying, okay, I don't like this. Who, which mother would like this? It's a bitter cup, but I want to be faithful to you to use it however you want. And so we saw then that God had put into our hands something that he wants to use for his glory, for the rescuing of millions of lives. It has to be bigger than what happened at Alpha, because now it's two children. And so we're saying, okay, God, we don't like it, but we want to see your glory. We want to see your glory being shed on this earth. We want to see millions and millions of people come to know Jesus through this and we offer it up to you as a living sacrifice as it were and we realize that God has put into our hands he's imparted to us his comfort and his love partly through you that we can now go out and comfort others that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 the comfort wherewith you've been comforted you can now comfort other people and so we realize that God's put there various ways of comforting people. We realize that the brokenhearted, so many people now we've ministered, parents who have lost children uh, or loved ones, that we can offer them because we've walked the walk. We know, we know what they're going through. We feel the pain. So we see that God's put this for the brokenhearted. We see for depression. Ginny was depressed for many years through her terrible grief. We can now minister into the people who are depressed. We see su suicide because obviously the spirit of suicide attacked our family and was after Jeannie for many years. So we can minister to people who know that. Broken marriages, marriages that aren't working. Statistically, our marriage should never have worked. They say up to 19 out of 20 marriages fail after the suicide of a child. And yet by God's grace, I'm more in love with Jeannie now, and I believe she is with me too, than ever before. We can minister into broken, and then finally, eternity. Because God's opened up eternity to me, we can be able to share, and Jeannie, we can share this great message of eternity. You see, I know with all my heart that both Alex and Rebecca, they knew Jesus. They'd received him as their, as their savior. Yes, Alex made a terrible mistake, but you know, the blood of Jesus covers our mistakes by his mercy. So I know with all my heart, I'm gonna see my precious Alex and my precious Rebecca. I'm gonna hug Jesus first when I, get, when I get to heaven. And then very quickly, I'm gonna hug Rebecca and Alex too. And we're gonna be together again. I don't think it's long, because I think Jesus is coming back soon. But for now, we've got a work to do. For now, God's saying, I want you to be my hands and feet in loving people. And our, we started this ministry, we realized God was calling, calling us out of Alpha and into a new ministry called Awakening to God. Awakening to a bigger vision of God. A bigger vision of how great our God is, all powerful. A bigger vision of how he wants to come to us and help people who are hurting and broken. A bigger vision of his calling on our lives. Each one of us, whatever he's calling us to do. And so we, I left Alpha and I, we started off this ministry and we said, okay, God, whatever you want. And the founding scriptures are Isaiah 61, one to four. These are the words that Jesus used when he started his ministry. Do you remember what he said? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do what? He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. You see what he's been giving us? To help bind up the brokenhearted, to bring freedom to the captives. Who are captives? Captives are people who have suffered terribly because of the brokenness of, the world, of this world. Nothing that they have done. It's not bad decisions by them. Maybe they were abused as children. They didn't, they didn't ask for that or deserve it. 
or maybe they've lost their, their health or their finances. Those are captives. They've been wounded deeply. You may know people like that. Maybe there's some here who you know what I'm talking about. And then he said to bring light to the prisoners. Prisoners are people who have made bad decisions and maybe they're now in prison to addiction or maybe they're incarcerated. Either way, Jesus said, I've come to set you free. I've come to bring you into my kingdom, which is a kingdom of, of freedom. It's a kingdom of love and of joy and of peace. I've come to set you free. So we said, okay, Lord, whatever we want. And then earlier this year, we just had a great heart for India. Um, I, I visited India when I was in banking and I was just broken, broken to see the suffering there. India is known as the land of suffering. And they're taught in their religion that they're suffering because of something they did wrong in their last life. And they have to go through the suffering and you mustn't help them because they have to go through the suffering. And I know a God who doesn't say that. I know a God who says, no, I love you so, so much that I gave my son. If you were the only one on this earth, my son would have come to rescue you. My son would have come to love you and to bring you back into my arms. I know a God like that who can come and bring them the comfort by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're praying like this and say, Lord, what do you want us to do? And then I get a phone call and someone rings me up from India and says, would you come and speak to a leaders conference in Nagpur at the end of October? I said, yeah, I suppose I will. God was working, you see, because we realize now that God has put something into our heart. He's imparted something to us through this brokenness to rescue people. And we realize that there's a, a highway that we can use now to get the message out of God's love. It's the equivalent of the Roman road in Jesus' time. The Romans made the road so that the gospel could go out. The language is Koine Greek, which came from Alexander the Great. He developed Koine Greek so that the New Testament could be translated and understood by so many people going down the Roman road. The third thing to connect with people is story. There was a, the American parable that says that he who, tell, he who tells a story controls the people. We're not controlling in the wrong way. We're talking about as you tell stories, you connect with people. And we realize that actually the way to connect with people, arguably the greatest way to connect with people is through suffering. Because some people, many people in the world, they've never known love, but they've known suffering. And so what we, what we find now is when we tell our story, people listen to us. How, how, how can you be going on after two of your three children? How does that work? Where's God in all of this? That you're following a God who allowed this to happen? What is this? And so we realized God was calling us to use the highway of today. You know what that is? Social media. It's the, it's the te technological highway. It reaches billions of people. Two billion people use Google. 1.5 billion people use Facebook. Every day, 1.1 billion people use Facebook. So we started. We said, okay, God, we're going to use. We started uh, Awakening to God Facebook page. At the beginning of June this year, we had 2,000 followers. And as we started to get the message out of God's love and God's goodness and just proclaiming Jesus Christ, the graph has gone like that. As at this morning, we had 106,000 followers. People who are getting engaged, they're starting to share the, the, the messages that we put out. They're starting to ask questions and for prayer and all sorts of things going on. The opportunity to tell people about Jesus is unbelievable. We've got, the, we've got this highway of communication. We've got the language English, or you can translate it, through technologies that you can understand and now we've got story. Do you get the picture? So we say, okay, God, we're going off to India. What are we going to do? What do you want us to do, Lord? And we had this great heart to help people. The first thing is bring good news to the poor. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could take 100,000 families in poverty and give them something to bless them? So we thought, we'll give them a mosquito nets because many people still die of mosquito bites in, in India. So we're going to give 100,000 families later this year, each of those families a mosquito net. It's going to cost us $130,000. I don't know how we're going to get it yet, but we're trusting. And then we're going to give them this, this calendar. 
This, the, the mosquitoes for their natural needs, this is for their spiritual needs. People have been told that they're suffering because they deserve it and they can't get out of it. This calendar, every day of every, uh, every month, is being told that there's a God who loves you. It's got a scripture on every day. These are scriptures that God helped us with. And I want to ask you that, for, I would love everyone or every household to have one of these. There's not many left, so you don't scramble too much. And I want to ask for your help. Would you be the body of Christ and help us again with this great mission? Most of these will be Hindu families and we want to bless them and bring the love of Jesus to them. They're, they cost $10, but hey, if you can't afford $10, we want you just to have them, okay? That's God's heart, it's going to be right. If you can afford more, then perhaps you want to give more. But we'd love you to have these and have you have to pray each day for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out through this story that God has put into our lives for his glory and his honor. You see, it's not about us, it's all about him. It's all about him being lifted up and exalted and rescuing precious souls for eternity. We're always going to be together. Those of us in Jesus are going to be together for a great, and we'll have a great time together. Those of you who haven't met Rebecca, you'll meet Rebecca and you'll meet Alex as well. It's going to be a special time. Very wonderful. Let me close, if I may, with three points. Three things to remember, if you, may, if you will. Number one, from here on in, I encourage you with all my heart, live, have an eternal perspective. Don't just live for this world. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end very quickly relative to eternity. Live for the eternal things, which basically says, God, here I am. I'll do whatever you want me to do. You're building up treasure in heaven then. You may be a bit nervous, but you can trust him, can you? I trust that your grace is sufficient for me. Whatever you ask me to do, you'll give me the grace to do it. Grace is basically the empowering, the equipping to keep going and to serve God. You'll give me the grace to do it. Live with an eternal perspective. Number two, love your loved ones and appreciate them and give thanks for them. Your spouse, your children, your extended family, your friends. Because let me tell you, when they're not here, you miss them so, so much. So give thanks, will you? for those of your loved ones, every moment of every day. Never take them for granted. Just enjoy the moment. In doing that, you give glory to God. And number three, be strong. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. Each day, I do it several times, Holy Spirit, give me strength. I, I, we can't do this on our own, but his promise is that he will give us power to be his witness, to witness for him, to live in a way that gives him glory through his power. Fill me, Holy Spirit, will you? Help me in this journey. And um, part of that, the second thing, be strong and be very courageous. You know what courage is? Courage is says, I'm going to go for it. Whatever it takes, I'm going to go for it. I'm all in, Lord. I'm not hanging back. If you live like that, may we pray. I'll give it out because I... Uh, no one responded to this in the first service, but I, as I was praying before the service, I had a sense of... God wanting to bring some healing this morning. Uh, uh, I think it's for a guy, I may be wrong, but someone who's been suffering recently with headaches. Um, the word Ralph came in, I may be wrong with that, but the name Ralph, but I, I just uh, a nudge of the Holy Spirit, so I want to be faithful to give that out. So Father, we just, we thank you once more for Jesus. We thank you for your amazing love for us. We thank you for this incredible world in which we live, Lord. And we thank you for the eternity that stretches out before us, where there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Lord, help us to be faithful to whatever you've called each one of us to do, to realize that you've given us your grace through Jesus to equip us to do the things that you've planned for us to do. So, Father, I pray you would strengthen every one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit in our inner being, that we may walk by faith and complete the work that you've planned for us to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.